What up, Hello Ego here. Today I want to show you how I create multi-sample instruments using Ableton's sampler. I use a lot of hardware in my studio, a lot of external synthesizers, and occasionally it's nice for me to be able to create an instrument based out of uh, waveforms I create with these instruments. Just to kind of, you know, share them around or take them on the road with me. I uh, can't always bring my synths with me wherever I go, so it's nice to be able to sample these things and create a very functional instrument out of this. Before I start, just want to say, if you like this tutorial, I've got a lot more like it on my Patreon, as well as sample packs. I give away a lot of devices uh, that I create from my synths, things like this instrument I'm about to go over with you. I also create some custom sample packs. I'll do track review for you. And I also offer private lessons. I wanted to say as well that the instrument that I made that made me want to do this video is available for free on my gum road. I just uploaded it and there's a link down in the description. So you can go ahead and nab this instrument and uh, yeah, hope you enjoy it because it's a really, really fat sub, very nice analog sounding sub. So let's jump back into it over here. Now, what I did to create this was I took, what are these like 10, 11 recordings <clears throat> from my oscillator, all right? And all I did for this was I basically set up an external instrument and I set MIDI to my 2HP MIDI device. If this was like, you know, um, you know, I also have an Arturia Mini Freak, which I'll turn on here so this will now appear. So now my, or Micro Freak, so my Arturia Micro Freak now shows up here. Let's say I wanted to create an instrument based out of my Arturia Micro Freak. I can set that up right there, get my audio input, set my audio input to come from the Scarlet, which is my sound card in my studio. And I will take the input from, looks like it's input two. There we go. That is my Arturia uh, Micro Freak that we're hearing. Now all I have to do, let's turn this off for the time being. All I have to do is create a note. And I usually make these quite long because I don't wanna have to, I, I would like to avoid looping usually, but I'll show you how to set up looping. So I'll set this up so it's very long sound. Like so. And then I create a new channel and I just resample this. Uh, I can also set this just directly to take audio from three. And let's go ahead and record this sound. Okay, and there we have it. Now I will go through and do this to however, you know, whatever degree I want. Let's just call this one C. I make sure I keep track of all the naming conventions here. Like if I don't want to do every single note, I might do every other note and then we can set up, but for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to do every single note, but I'm only going to demo a couple of these. Lovely. Now, so you don't have to sit through all of this. What I'm going to do is just pause the video. I'm going to take one octave of samples from this, just basically the init nervous keys patch on the uh, micro freak over here. So I want to pause the recording and I'll jump back in when I've recorded one full octave of sounds. Okay. So I've gone through and recorded a whole chromatic scale from C to C. Next thing I want to do is I'm going to go through and consolidate each of these and I'll show you why in a moment. I just paused the video again so you don't have to sit through me consolidating all of these. But the reason why I consolidated all of them is because when you consolidate an audio clip, like let me just undo the last one, okay? So check out this last one here. I have not consolidated it yet. If you look at the gain, the gain says zero decibels. But I want this to be normalized. I want it to be as loud as this audio can get without it actually clipping. So there's a really nice feature in Ableton where when you consolidate a, hit, a clip by hitting Command J, now the gain, even though this volume hasn't changed in the sample, the gain now says negative 15.7 decibels. So that 
shows me that there are 15.7 decibels between where the volume of the clip currently is and how loud it can get without clipping. So now I can double click this and hit zero and now I've made this as loud as it goes and I can do the same thing for all of these here. There we go. I now have all these samples nice and neat, right? Just a bunch of uh, recordings from the init patch on the Arteria Micro Freak. Next thing I want to do, let me close this down. We don't need it right now. Next thing I want to do is go grab a sampler from my device browser over here. I'm going to open up Zone. And actually, I want to name all these first. So I'm going to go ahead and pause once more and name all these. That way I don't get confused. There we go. All named. Nice and neat. Now I can grab all of these. Let's make this one C2, actually. And drop them into my sampler. So let's go ahead and grab them all and highlight the sampler so it opens. And I'm going to drop them into the zone section here. Oh, it didn't copy the name. That's pretty annoying. I wish it had. I thought that it would, so I'm not really sure what the deal is with that. But let me undo this here and just go one by one. And now that I've done that, you can see they're all in here in order. Now I have to go through and rename all these. Wish I didn't have to do this, but apparently you do. Okay, now everything is named nice and neat. We're all organized. The next thing I have to do is I have to set up the key ranges here so that when I play a C, only this C that is held down right here plays. How I can do that is select over here. We can divide up these ranges by key by hitting this key button in the uh, chain selector up here. And what I want to do is I want to adjust the top end of this so that it only starts playing on C3. All right, now everything from C3 and beneath, we played with this one key. And then on this one, I'll take it up so that C sharp three is the only one that it plays. And then so far, you know, so just keep continuing like that. I don't know if I was gonna say so far, so long, so far, so and so on, like that, all the way up until you have distributed these Oops, skipped one there. What you can do if you miss one, you can just kind of drag it around like that. Uh, be careful you don't grab the thin bar on the top because that creates a crossfade. Uh, we don't want to create any crossfades here. Let's just do that right there, that right there, all the way up until the top. And then once we reach the top, we're going to do the same thing but the opposite of what we did with the first C. Like that, like that, like that. Okay, and now we get to C4, and then we just leave the top end like that. So everything C3 below will be played with that one sample, and then everything for C3 or C four and above, we played with another sample. So this is what I said, like you can go as extensive as you want, right? This basically has a good functional range of this one octave in here. If I wanted to go really crazy with it, I would create more than an octave. Uh, I would, you know, sample quite a lot. You would probably sample, you know, at least four or five octaves of this to create a larger functional range. But this works right now. Now you notice right here, we have these little R's and this stands for the root note. Okay, so that means that basically, if the root note, which is set appropriately here, if the root note is C3 and on my keyboard, I press a, the key C3, that means I'm gonna hear a C3 back. However, if the root note is not on, then you're gonna hear a different pitch, all right? So we have to get the root note for each of these samples to um, line up with where we have the key mapping set to. So I'm gonna go ahead and click over to the sample zone over here. We can see that this is sample C root C3. Let's go to sample C sharp and set the root to be C sharp. D, D, and just match all these up like this. D sharp or E flat, they're enharmonic equivalents. Like so. Go to G, 
G sharp, a. This is why it's nice to name your samples because it makes it a lot easier and organized and quick to do these sorts of things. This probably will say A sharp. We actually want B flat, which is the same thing. Then we got a B and then all the way up to C4. So now when we play a C1, a B, you know, we play a C, a D, an E, an F, when we play the note, we're going to actually hear that pitch. It's a very important part to putting this together. Uh, this is almost ready to play. However, sometimes you maybe want to set up, like let me go ahead and actually just play a few, a few pitches on it here to show you what we got going on so far. Make a little melody here. There we go. Now, It'll work when I go down further octaves, even though we don't have samples for that. We'll still play. And it actually sounds kind of cool. Maybe you, you know, Sounds good, but you hear that like vibrato sound? It's going a lot slower, right? Wow, wow, wow. Because it's playing through the sample more slowly in order to reach those lower pitches. Same deal as if we go up a few octaves, it's going to play that vibrato much faster. It's terrible. It's playing it a lot faster because it's running through the sample faster in order to achieve that higher pitch. We don't get that when we stay within this uh, octave because the vibrato was recorded at the same speed from the synth. So that's one of the downsides of doing it this way. But, you know, this is, like I said, it's a quick and dirty one. I would probably be a little more extensive if I were to do this for an actual functional instrument. Um, but the next thing we might want to do is perhaps set up some looping situation, right? Because we have a time limit for how long these samples will play. done. But what if I want to hold it longer? Like what if I want to create a long pad or something? I need to set up looping for each of these. Um, I also wanted to uh, bring up to attention. Notice how when I played this sample, it did not pull the correct sample up over here. If you click this little button right next to where it says Lin, then every time you play a note, it'll show the, the note that's being played in the sample browser here. That's kind of helpful and useful. So on this one, how do we set looping up? Well, we could set it up a few different ways. Uh, for this one, it might be a little tricky, but I'm gonna hit just sustain mode forward and forward. That means when it reaches the end of the loop, it goes back to the beginning of the loop and starts over again. Here we have forward and stop, which is not looping. And here we have pendulum mode, where it'll go to the end and then it'll play backwards through it and reach the end of the loop and then keep going back and forth like that. So you just gotta figure out what works best for the sample that you're using. For this one, I'm going to set up a little loop that goes something like that. Um, and, you know, let's do it earlier on in the sample so we don't have to wait forever. Hear that pop in there? We want to try and avoid that. We want to try and get rid of that. Now, you can get rid of it by doing a loop at the sample crossing point. So if you zoom in on your sample, this is not making it louder. It's just allowing you to see the waveform more clearly. What I try and do is I try and line up my loop to get as close as I can to a sample crossing point like this or a zero crossing point. You can usually can't get it exact, but like very close is good. And then what's this? It is like a descending. So it looks like it's going down then up. So I want to have the sample start in the same place in the waveform somewhere around there. Let's try and zoom in and get it as close as we can. Ooh, that's actually, that's pretty close. Now let's check this out, and I'm going to set this to forward mode as opposed to pendulum mode. It's not bad. There's a little bit of like a... Um, timing issue with the vibrato that's happening. So you'd have to figure out the timing for the vibrato. Uh, probably approximate it here a little bit.
Yeah. Now that's going to be tough to figure out for this sound, but it gives you an idea of what you have to do. That's exactly what I did for this sampled sub instrument that I wanted to show you, and the one that is available for free, by the way, if you want to download it. Um, what I did was I went into, I downloaded a bunch of waveforms, a really nice fat sub sound. Lots of rich upper harmonics. It's got a pretty squared off shape to it. It's like a very saturated sign. And then I went into this instrument. I organized it the same way that I just showed you how to organize it. A sub is pretty much functional only around over an octave, octave and a third or something like that. So I only basically made a little bit more than an octave. That's going to be the functional range for the sub anyway. I went in here and meticulously figured out where the zero crossing point is and I set this up so it does not click as best as I could. I also went in and I believe I faded off. Oh yeah. I set the start point to be at the zero crossing point so we don't get any click at the beginning of it as well. And yeah, that's basically it. And I just went through for every single one of these and did the same thing. And now it's a very functional, very uh, useful sub. So that's basically how I set up my uh, sampled instruments, kind of give you a little bit of a start as to how to set do multi-samples. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, I might make a, another video in the future about this that goes even more in depth. These are pretty simple instruments, but if you just got waveforms and you just want to, you know, set something up using some waveforms like a sub or something like that, this is a great way to do it.